Thank you. Okay, we're good. All right, so today I want to talk about, um, well, I, I, I want to motivate uh, a problem that exists in uh, Postgres replication setups and then propose a solution for this and then hopefully you can all go out of here and your problems are solved. The alternative is you didn't even know you had these problems and now you're getting nervous, so we'll, we'll, we'll see on what uh, side you're in. So yes, I'm, I'm Peter Eisentraut, I work for EDB and I've been a Postgres developer for a long time and I had a small part in this project, so I'm mainly here to present this on, on behalf of some others I have, I have worked with. So we're talking, in, in case this was not entirely clear, we're talking about replication here in this session. And particularly we're talking about uh, non-trivial replication setups that involve combinations of physical and logical replication. So always keep that in mind as I'm gonna go through uh, diagrams and scenarios here, right? There's the physical replication where just the, the, the bits and the bytes are copied, and this is what m many people hopefully use to you know, have, a, have a standby for their server, and then there's logical application where, well, the, the, the information is shipped in some, in, in some logical way um, for, for different use cases, and when, when you combine those two, then uh, possibly inter interesting things happen. So I'm gonna build up some diagrams here and, and try to explain some scenarios and I'm gonna try to point at things here, so uh, feel free to, uh, you know, and, and at some point maybe this is getting too complicated, but then the, the, the point really is that what I'm gonna show you at the end will solve this, so maybe if you don't even understand, you don't necessarily have to like understand all of this to the, to the fine details, uh, hopefully there will be a solution at the end. All right, so this is the, the, the starting point. This is pretty straightforward. I just mentioned that, right? You, you start with the classical physical replication uh, uh, setup. You have the, the primary that you, this the one you actually use, and then you have a standby just in case the primary has, has a problem or it, you know, it fails or you need to do some maintenance and then you fail over it. One thing that is, out of scope and, and what I'm gonna go through is how you orchestrate that, right? You can set this up manually and then set up all the, you know, the, the, the connections manually and then do the failover manually, but there's obviously solutions for that, right? There's Petroni is very popular, there's, uh, we just talked about PG Auto failover as a possibility, all the, uh, you know, uh, solutions, Web Manager, for example, these kind of things you would, no, would typically use in conjunction with these scenarios, but this is independent of that, right? But just sort of in, uh, keep imagining that. So you have that, and then you have this idea, I wanna have some logical application attached to that also, because you know, logical application has a variety of scenarios. This could be change data capture that you just wanna sort of ship off through, you know, Debezium is something people use nowadays, or there's other ways to do that, or you wanna, just replicate a subset, or you want to combine multiple logical sources into a sort of a data warehouse or things like that, right? That's, those are scenarios for logical applications. So that's fine, you can do this in Postgres. Obviously, this has been also available for a long time. Now, I mentioned, you know, physical application typically used for sort of disaster scenarios. So now what happens if actually the, the sort of disaster or, or, or uh, you need to do maintenance or whatever, you do the actual failover. Right? Again, there should, usually there's an orchestration software, but this could be done manually, right? So you would, you know, this guy, somehow you either disable it or it, it just it fails in some, some way, you would you know, fence it off ideally, or turn it off. You have some connection routing is updated, then all the clients connect to the new one that you promote. The same you would do to the logical application client or receiver. You would point it to that one and it would reconnect and try to continue the replication, but that actually doesn't work. Right. So if you just do that, it's not gonna work. Because there's a thing called replication slots that you know, you've presumably heard of if you've ever done logical application or also physical application. So to you know, motivate that, a replication slot is basically a way for a replication 
receive or to register themselves with the provider to say like I want to replicate and that tells the provider to basically keep track of what the receiver has already re received and processed right so that's what the purpose of a replication slot is and if you do what the, this sort of failover scenario that I just uh, showed the, the replication slot exists here but the failover doesn't move it over here there is no replication slot so this guy is just going to connect say hey I want to keep replicating from slot one and this guy is just going to say there's no slot one so that doesn't you know, this this is what would happen if you just do this now, right? Now there is a sort of a hackish simple solution that you just make a new slot here, then that would continue. If you give it the same name, then it would notice the, the, the slot is there and then you, it would continue, but that would potentially lose data, you know, between the time that this failover event happened and you just manually create a slot here, then there's, there's obviously a gap, right? So, that's not a sound solution, but I suppose those of you who have looked into that might have actually done that as a workaround and kind of just accept this data loss. And that's probably okay in, in, in some scenarios, but if you want to have the lo logical application you know, to be sort of a, 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 an accurate and, 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 and precise copy of data, not just sort of an approximation, then this is not an acceptable solution, right? And that's the problem we want to solve here. So this issue that I'm describing is a, is a long-running project. And a long, a long time ago now, a solution was proposed, which is called failover slot. So the naming here is a little bit, uh, the name has gone through various iterations, so you know, we have to be careful. But if you, if you sort of Google for PostgreSQL uh, failover slots, you will get mailing list threads from sort of around 2016 or so. There was a, a solution to this problem proposed that we wall log replication slots, basically. Right? So any change to a replication slot will also be written to the write ahead log, which is the underlying physical application, right? And so then the replication slots would then automatically be updated on the standbys. And there is a patch was proposed in you know, 2016 around uh, Postgres 9.6 timeframe and that, that was, uh, well, it was ended up not being accepted. We have actually run this at my uh, jobs. We have provided this patch in sort of custom versions for a variety of customers. So that solution does actually work, but there was, it, it, it didn't go into the, the main line because the, the, one of the at least main drawbacks is that if you do that, you are tying the replication slots on the primary and standby together, and you can't make replication slots independently of the standby. All right, so let's look at an updated diagram here. So the, the, the idea would have been, or at least at the time with the patch, would have been, okay, the physical application is the same, but the slot information is included here. And so the, the slot that happens here is automatically also appears here. And then you can do that failover. Do we have a picture of that now? Right. So th then it works. So the sidebar was and an, that the, the, the making independent replication slots on standby, which was the objection back in 2016 for why we couldn't do the failover slots approach, that actually exists now. Some of you might have been in the presentation just before this one. When I wrote these slides, I looked at the schedule and my understanding was that this talk would have been later, so I wanted to sort of encourage you to go to that one, but it already happened now, so, but it doesn't matter, right? So this thing now exists, but it, that's a, well, it's nice that that exists, but it's, a, it's an independent thing, right? It doesn't, the fact that this exists now doesn't affect what I'm talking about or vice versa, okay? So but you can you can do this now, right? To maybe just to summarize the talk from last hour. <laughs> so this works now, right? And you know, why would you want to do that? Right? It's you know, possibly a variety of reasons having to do with your network layout or whatever you want to do. But also one good reason is that the logical decoding that happens here is you know is actually processing intensive. So just offloading it is, might be a good idea. So it's it's a reasonable uh, feature to have. So but anyway, so that was the first approach we tried to solve this problem. 
and th that that goes under the name failover slots. The failover slots w in that uh, patch was basically a flag on the replication slot. You can say, do you want this replication slot to be a failover slot? In that case, it gets included into the wall, so that was kind of the terminology. But that is sort of a, a dead um, approach by now. So a new solution, and the one I'm proposing today is that we have a separate process apart from the wall that synchronizes the slots. And then you have the flexibility, you can configure that in, in independently of this, uh, the, the wall replication that you can say, I want to replicate the slots or not, or maybe some slots, right? So the picture here is uh, to illustrate that what that means is that the physical replication does its own thing and then there's a separate connection that is just for the slot syncing. And that's, a, you know, as you can imagine, it's a very lightweight thing. It just has to say what slots do we have. And a replication slot itself is really just a very small data structure that contains an LSN that says how, or, you know, sort of a, a number basically of how far have you replicated and, and a name and some very small amount of data. So that's, you know, very lightweight. And you can do that independently of the wall if you want, right? So this gives you the additional flexibility of saying what slots you want there and you can have slots independently on the, on the standby. So how do you do, okay, so it sounds great. How do you get this? So I'm going to talk about PG failover slots in a minute, but this technology or this approach, let's say, technology is a bit of a fancy word, but this approach has been already in production for, for some years in PG Logical version 3. So some of you might know the PG Logical project from way back when. PG Logical 3 is a, a version uh, that was never open source, but it has been used by uh, formerly Second Quadrant and now EDB uh, in production for you know some time. So this approach is not something that was just invented a couple months ago. This has been in use and has been refined for some time. And what we effectively did was that we took, you know, wanted to make this approach more widely available and basically took the relatively small pieces that do this out of PG Logical and made it into a, an independent extension. And that's what PG failover slots became the, the extension. So the naming here is maybe a bit uh, un unfortunate in some sense that the term failover slots, as I just uh, explained, was sort of a failed attempt to do it. And now the new extension that has a new approach that doesn't actually use failover slots is called PG failover slots. But anyway, the, the, you know, if you're sort of researching the history of this, it's confusing, but hopefully this is just now the, the, the new name we can do. So I put Petroni here, and I want to explain this. Um, if you look into what Petroni has done about uh, this area in general, it has gone through a couple of iterations of this, and some of those were unfortunately partially wrong and uh, led to issues, and then they were fixed, and then more issues were discussed with this approach. So I'm going to caution against relying on Petroni doing the right thing. But let's kind of come back to that uh, at the end. Uh, so the first thing that Petroni did was actually sort of synchronize the replication slots at the time of failover, which I illustrated earlier it doesn't actually work correctly. Um, but if you think about this, you know, this you can almost kind of do by hand in a way. All you have to do is some, having some kind of job that you know, kind of runs in the loop and say, oh, what's your application slot here? Okay, I'm going to sync it over here. So that, you know, that this is relatively straightforward. And that's basically what uh, PG Logical and PG Playoff slots do. And, you know, in principle, other s services can, uh, can also do this. There's, you don't actually have to be, you know, sort of in the server. This could be just an external service, right? So Petroni can do that, but PG failover slots is an extension that runs as a background worker that can do that. So, but we'll come back to sort of the issues with Petroni in a, in, a, in a bit. But so that's what I'm proposing today. PG failover slots is an open source extension that we, meaning at uh, EDB, uh, published earlier this year. You know, it's on on GitHub. It's a normal, so it, it's technically not an extension in the way that you create extensions. So let's call it a plugin. And I'll show in a minute how, how you'd actually set it up. And you know, it's open source, Postgres license. It's there's, there's sort of no, no, no tricks to it, so to speak here, right? So we're encouraging everybody to use this. And the nice thing about this also, this works with 
all supported all supported Postgres major, major versions. Well, 11 is out of support as of today, but it as of as of now, but it uh, in principle supports Postgres 11 through 16, also in different combinations, right? So th th that th that's quite nice. So you can use this immediately, even with the old installations. So let's look at how you set it up. So this is available through the usual community packaging channels. The package names are weirdly confusing, but that's just the way that it's been set up. So right, you you just install this package. Subs as as is usual for server plugins, there's one package for each major version, so you have to install the one for, for your major version, right? So 16 in this case, or a, a different number. So the, you know, these are the usual sources for RPM and Debian packages, but you know, it could also be available elsewhere. And then you load it. So I mentioned it's not an extension in that sense, it's a plugin. So you load it in shared preload library, so it is loaded very early in the server process. You have to load it on the on the primary and the standby, and then on the standby you also have to set up hot standby feedback. That's basically the main requirement, and then you have to set a, you have to specify the physical replication slot that corresponds to your uh, physical replication. So that's what you usually do anyway. So those last two are you know pretty pretty standard, and then you just load that uh, extension. And then there's some configuration settings you can do to tweak some of these things. These are optional, so it works without that, but it gives you some flexibility. The, the first one is you can configure what slots you want to sync. Right, so in, in the examples I gave, there's always one slot here, so that, you know, in that case, you probably want to sync that one, but you can imagine more complex scenarios where you have Lots of slots here, and lots of logical application consumers, maybe for a variety of reasons, right? This could be for backup, data warehousing, you know, message queue, all these kinds of scenarios. You could all have them concurrently, and maybe you want to, for, for whatever reason, not sync some of them or sync some of them. So you can configure that, and there's a sort of mini configuration language, in a sense, that is available for that. And there's documentation for that, so I'm not going to go through all these details, but to, just to know that that's possible. If you say, like, I, don't, I only want to sync that one and not the other one, so here in this, the, the default setting is that it syncs all of them, and but you can give sort of a pattern of which ones you want to sync, or you can also just list them out. There's things like that, right? So that's possible. The other interesting question is that we, as the sort of people who put this all together, uh, were struggling with is what do you do if a replication slot is dropped on the primary do you the, do you then also drop it on the on the standby is that you know this is sort of a difficult question depending on what you mean right so what we settled on the default setting is that yes we do do that which is you know because what you don't you, you don't want to have replication slots lying around that are not in use because they keep resources and ultimately they would fill up your disk. So you do want to make sure things get cleaned away. If for some reason you you want to have that experience, right? If your replication is all set up nicely, you want to make a config sort of somehow a setup change. You go in, drop the you know drop the subscription that drops the replication slot. You want to have this experience. Well, then it's also gone over there. I don't want to have to like chase it down. But maybe for some reason you don't want that because you have some other orchestration that takes care of that already, maybe, or you know it's also maybe you feel it's too dangerous. Because then you could, if you somehow misuse this, you could imagine that if you connect something to a primary that doesn't have the right slots, then all of a sudden it automatically deletes all your application slots on your standby that you maybe connected incorrectly. So it's a bit risky, but we settled on that. But if you don't like it, you can change that. Okay. All right. So that's the. That could have been it, but it's not. Uh, but that's basically the solution to this scenario I explained at the beginning, where the old failover slots approach was added, and that basically works. So, but as we were all, you know, over the years, as we were 
deploying this via PG Logical 3, as I explained, we noticed another problem that we also had to solve, so I'm gonna explain that. And that's less, less known, a little bit more tricky. Okay, so this is a new, I'm gonna have another diagram here, this, but this is independent of the previous ones. Okay, so let's look at this scenario again. We have physical application pair up here and a logical application pair hanging on it. And I have here in this diagram LSNs. For those of you who don't know exactly what this is, this is basically just a counter in a way how far replication has progressed, logical uh, log sequence number. This is in, in Postgres how replication keeps track of how far all these participants have, have uh, progressed. And I'm using small numbers, that's not realistic, but just for, to illustrate this example. Right? So in this case, let's look at the, the numbers. So the, the primary is obviously most ahead of all of them because that's where the new data appears. And then because of you know, network delays or processing speed and stuff like that, all these consumers of that could have different uh, progress. So in this made up scenario, this guy is you know, a fair amount behind. So if you're at nine here, this guy is okay, pretty well caught up. He's at eight, and then this guy is uh, further behind at the moment. Now you do the failover. Okay, so this is the kind of thing you have to kind of wrap your head around a bit, bit right? So now we have the slot, we have that, you know, the first issue was solved, we have the slot, we can do the, the failover, we can do the promotion. This all works, it will do something, but if you think about it, it's bad. So if this guy, then, you know, after the, failover and the orchestration adjusts everything, reconnects to this guy and says, I want to replicate. I have gone to eight. This guy's at five, said, okay, that's fine. Then you're already at eight, don't worry about it. But this guy is at five and will receive new data at some point from the application, right? The application will keep writing stuff in it, presumably. And it will start sort of a new, it's not a timeline, but you can think about it. It's a new, it's a, a new way of, uh, in, of of counting the LSN. So the next change that arrives here will have six, seven, eight. But this guy thinks they're already at eight, so they're going to just ignore all these changes coming through. So they are not going to get that new data that's coming, that's being processed here. So that will be lost. And that's the first one side of the the coin, so to speak. The other side of it, this guy has data for LSN six through eight that came from here, but that is, you know, that was essentially is no longer canonical because that failover happened and that data was missing on the primary and the application would have assumed that that was never committed. But this guy has already consumed that and, and you know, replayed that. And so if new data comes from here, that could then conflict with the old data. But it, it wouldn't conflict here because that guy doesn't have that, but it could conflict here because that guy has additional data that that guy doesn't have. And so you have a sort of an inconsistent data between your replicas and there's no way to, to consolidate that because you can't roll this back, right? This, this, that's not functionality that exists. You would, you know, you would somehow I want to do a rollback to roll this one back to LSN5, but that, that, that's not possible. So this will run, this will progress, things will happen, everything looks good, but you will have some data lost and also additional data that shouldn't be there that could con cause conflicts in the future. Okay. Another scenario that's, you know, the same underlying issue, but a, another sort of scenario in practice. Let's say you have two logical uh, receivers attached here that, so again, this one is at nine, this one is at five, a fair amount behind, and these two are at, dif at different LSNs when the failover event happens. So then, you know, they would connect and stuff. That's depending on, you know, how what your requirements are. Then that would work. But now, these two standbys have are at different states, and you, there's no way you can make them equal again, because the the information 
of what the difference between seven and eight is was contained here. That guy is gone. Here, new LSNs are being produced. So these two are never going to be the same again. And maybe that's OK in some cases. But in general, if this is sort of the way you have set up your your application or your, your database installation, then you have you know these standbys that maybe you want to load balance between or whatever, and then but they're all different, <laughs> right? So and then you can't consolidate them anymore. So that's that's also not good. So that is the other issue that really needs to be solved for this setup. And so the the, the solution there is that you need to order the way the replication happens so that the the logical subscribers or logical consumers are never ahead of the physical standbys that you have as a potential failover target. Okay, that's a complicated sentence, but that's basically what it needs to do, right? And so PG failover slots has a solution for that also built in, and you can configure that with this additional setting, PG, uh, standby slot names where you and so in, in this case, the queue here is referring to my scenario. This is this one here, right? So this is a what I just sort of called a, a potential failover target. And that's the one you have to make known so that these who want to follow that one potentially are never ahead of that one, OK? So that's that. Uh, so then it would look like that. So then this one is, you know, it's earlier was at eight or something, and, and this, there's some stuff happening here to make sure this does not get ahead of that one. And then you can do the failover, and then they're at five, or this one is at five or less, and then that would work. So that that is the solution that you need for this uh, scenario. OK? And so there's some, again, optional configuration you can do to, to tweak this if you have multiple. So maybe you, wanna, you have multiple physical st st put standbys here, you know, different availability, availability zones, data centers, and stuff like that. So you, have, you could have multiple here. You can configure them. So there's a comma list, potentially. And then there's also this sort of setup. You can say how many of those need to confirm so if you just want at least two of these to confirm, if you have multiple, that's a possibility. Obviously, then you need some careful orchestrations that, that when you do the failover, you f also check which one actually confirmed so you don't just randomly fail over to one. So for that, you need the orchestration. But this is sort of the low-level part of that that can give you the option. right? And then you have to wire together in some uh, clever way. So it, ha it has all the pieces, but there's some uh, fairly Complex configurations are possible. Okay, so, and this second problem, let's call it, that's what Petroni does not do, as far as I know. I'm pretty sure because that one, go back to that diagram, that one happens sort of here in this diagram, and that one actually has to happen in the Postgres server as a sort of a hook or something like that, right? The earlier issue to sync to application slot, you can sort of do this in user space. You just have to have some job running that looks here and looks there and synchronizes that. So you can do this. PG failover slots does it as a background worker. PG logical does it as a background worker. You know, but you can have some ag external agent like Petroni running that does that also. That's fine. But this, as far at least as far as I know, is not really possible to implement sort of in, in this user space manner, you have to either hook into Postgres or maybe you hook into the kernel if you want to go that way, but that's not what we're doing here. And so that is, is uh, needs this basically, right? All right. All right, so yeah, so it's out there now. Uh, we published it, well, this uh, in the first half of the year, I forgot when it was, so it's already out there uh, for a while. and. It's gotten quite a bit of a nice uh, mini community going. You know, people other than just EDB people have been using it, sending feedback, discussions, you know, 
improvements. I mean, the feature set is complete. This is not meant to be a thing that you know keeps adding new features every time. But you know, some ideas to to you know. There's some discussions maybe that have different sort of timeouts and stuff configurable, or you know, have some some clarified documentation and stuff like that. So there's a you know f feedback on the in the usual GitHub ways is is welcome. Possible things to do. If you think about this, this is also a problem if you use physical cascading replication. I'm not sure how popular that is nowadays. I mean, at least we haven't really encountered it. But the same issue of the of the ordering, the second problem I described, is just as applicable to physical slots. So, but PG Phillips slots as as it is now is not designed to support that. I'm not sure if it would actually work or not, but this is sort of on, on the mental to-do that we could support that for physical replication slots as well. Uh, and, 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 and so you can have just uh, you know cascading physical application, and then depending on what of these fails, you can point the other ones to, you know, it can be quite complicated. One thing we started working on, this is a bit stuck because of some, you know, sort of the people who were working on it had to work on something else, but we were actually working on integrating this into Petroni. So you, you know, Petroni would be aware that PG failover slots exist and use it for syncing the slots instead of its own internal mechanism. Uh, that doesn't was in progress when I wrote the abstract, so that's why it's in the abstract. But it, it, it's it's currently stuck, but it would be good to do. Yeah, and then maybe some monitoring. Monitoring would also be nice. Um, that's something we, you know, so, so you know, like how far the syncing and stuff has progressed. But right now, it's very minimal. Yeah. So, and then ultimately, you know, this is in some sense a workaround. But it's nice because it goes all the way back to Postgres 11. But I'll, uh, ideally, of course, this should be in Postgres core. This is being worked on. If you you know, follow Postgres development closely, there is a very lengthy and detailed discussion on on the hackers list and commit fest and so, so on for Postgres 17 to address the first problem of syncing the slots. The approach taken there is a bit different of what PG failover slots do, do uh, does. And you could have a technical philosophical argument which one of those is better. PG failover slots basically just, when it syncs the slot, it basically just you know, said, what's the slot LSN here? OK, it's 50. You go over there and just poke 50 in there, and that's it, roughly speaking. Another approach to forward the slot is to actually run it through logical decoding to, to sort of forward it the, the, the hard way, in a way. Or the, some people say the correct way. Some people say the hard way. So there's a bit of a technical discussion to be had there, which one is the good one. The, that the op one thing is for sure that PG failover slots is very efficient and low overhead because, as I just illustrated, it's it just looks at a number and puts the number here. That's basically what it does. If you run logical decoding to forward the slot, that can be very um, resource intensive, and if you have a lot of slots. And some of you will know at EDB, we have a, pro a, a project called Postgres Distributed, formerly known as BDR. And then if you have that set up, you have each node has tons of slots to set up the mesh or whatever it is. So if you do the, the, the logical decoding approach to forward a slot, that is, in our experience, not scalable enough. So there's some work to be done there. But the, the second issue of the, 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 the replication ordering is not, as far as I know, currently being attacked in Postgres community, but it should be. And uh, part of the reason why I'm here today is also to tell people about this, and hopefully we can also work together to solve that as well. Okay. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm really mostly the messenger here. I had a bit of a hand in getting PG failover slots as, as such, you know, put together and, and shipped. But really, the hard, hard work over many years has been done by these two colleagues and community members and contributors that you know 
some of you will, will recognize those names, Craig Ringer and Peter Jalanek, were you know, luminaries of all things replication in Postgres, so they really did all the hard work. So, really the summary here is be aware of these issues, Use if you want. I mean, I invite you. I encourage you to use PG Fellows laws because it, it does solve them, and it's you know it's pretty. You know, there's essentially no drawback, right? It's it's free. It's open source. It's relatively small. There's almost no overhead. You can configure it any way you want, as I showed, and it just does it. So, and it's you know easily packaged. So you know, please take a look, use it. Again, feedback on GitHub in the usual ways is welcome. We monitor that. And you know, if you sort of, if you have wrapped your, your head around that, also then contribute in the Postgres community on getting that into the Postgres mainline in the in the in the in the longer run. So that is my content. So um, thank you very much. And but we have some time for questions. Okay. Thank you, Peter. So we do have time for questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. Now we have. Uh, one, two, three questions. I'm going to start here with Dirk. Cool. Thanks a lot. Nice story. Uh, but if my primary is, uh, is at LSN 9 and my standby is at 5 and I fail over, I basically lose four sequences, right? So I lose some information. Yes, but that, that's sort of an issue that is separate. If you want to have, if you want to have, if you want to solve that issue, you need to use synchronous replication, I guess, right? And if I would do a sync commit, would that help? I guess not, but... Well, synchronous commit could mean a, little, a number of different things depending on, you know, there's all these different options. But, I mean, if you use synchronous commit, then some of these, you know, that issue goes away, but we're talking about the reverse in a way, right? So synchronous commit doesn't... This is the kind of question I... Uh, afraid of, not because it, it, they're not easy to answer, but it's really boring to just talk between us, so we can maybe sketch that out later, but the, 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 the important message to take home is just using synchronous replication doesn't fix all of this, okay? Okay, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so there was another question somewhere here, yep. Hi, I'm new to all of this, so it may be a very naive question. Okay. But you went into like out of band instead of in band uh, wall solution. You went into out of band communication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And is there any risk or maybe an opportunity if it gets out of sync? So, for example, LSNs coming from replication slot replication, like they will be ahead of a actual replication wall or something like this, or. Is it a risk? Is it a problem that they get out of sync? And maybe it's an opportunity. Like maybe the, the failover will know, oh, I'm kind of really behind because even some logical guys are far ahead from me, of me. And it could be like a monitoring event uh, or something. Yeah, I mean, so. that, that has been, I mean, that is an issue that obviously is known and is taken care of. You don't actually have to sync them exactly. You just have to kind of keep them to a certain threshold. and. All. It also has optimizations internally that if you have multiple slots, it doesn't actually sync each one of them individually. It just syncs all of them to the same level uh, in, in a way that is, we believe is correct. So there's no risk really to, for, for them to get getting out of sync because they don't actually need to be really in sync. They just have to be at that, uh, you know, not exceed the threshold depending on which side you look at. So yes. Okay, in the back, yeah. Uh, so the example you had where you had like uh, a follower on five and the primary on nine and then you have the quorum, one of the uh, other followers on eight and five gets elected or get, becomes the new mm -hmm. primary. Why not synchronize within a threshold from the existing nodes that are ahead of you so you can actually not lose any data? Or not any well, data if you can do on. that, then that's okay. But if you do the failover because the old server is in flames, then you don't have that option, right? So Why not? You have secondaries that you already have the data. Oh, if you have multiple, then you can fail over to the one that's furthest ahead? Is that what you're saying? How basically? do you know? Yeah? How do you know who's, the, who's ahead? 
Well, this is part of the orchestration that is out of you know, scope for this discussion, right? And in, in some sense, that's also a hard question to answer because then it, to answer that very precisely, you would have to halt everyone and look and, you know, this is a whole other talk of how do you... So, so my critique is exactly that. So you cannot have failover without quorum. Otherwise, you're going to have lose of data for sure. So if you don't know exactly the yeah. full state of the, your cluster in this case, you are taking a very, very big risk by making sure that you fail over to yeah, some This node. is probably also a question we should sketch on. There you go. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So also remember that the node that is ahead is a logical replication. So you cannot just copy the data back to the physical replication of the yeah. other side. It could just be a queue, right? So the data might not even be there. It's already been consumed, right? So. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Okay, so then, then I can have my question. <laughs> so when you say that you're not going to send, if I understand correctly, data to the logical replicas until it is being confirmed by the physical replicas, so that you are sure that the logical replicas are never ahead no. of the physical ones, that means that you're, you have to also monitor your disk for the wall and the primary, because if for some reason you start stopping. Yes, essentially this could you know, block indefinitely. It's, it's sort of a similar issue to the issues that you have with synchronous replication where you know if one guy is not consuming then everything blocks and things get backed up right so this sort of has a similar challenge for for monitoring certainly and at some point i guess you have to if it really gets stuck you have to you know kill it then or, or reconfigure it so yes that that issue is exists yeah okay so but it's possible so if you realize that none of the physical replicas is actually Acknowledging yeah. that you can dynamically, without having to restart or something, saying like, "Okay, now I'm just going to let." Yeah, the you can change these right. configuration parameter parameters then with the reload. Yes, with reload. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Are there any other questions? There's one question there. So you mentioned that <clears throat> there's some more work to be done for monitoring, uh, but currently, so is there some indication that uh, the primary has synced the current, uh, you know, lo logical uh, status, and you, we're up to date, for example, before you start some manual yeah, I mean, maintenance? You, yeah, you can see this by just connecting to all the nodes and see what the current status is. But the idea was there, maybe just have a nice view. PG failover slot status or you know whatever, and then just gives you a little summary of what it's doing. The information is all there because it just takes the number from here to there, and you can look what it is there. But the idea was just maybe to have a nicer like summary of that. Right. So before before we close the session, a, a few practical things. If you're not wearing or having this very nice T-shirt, don't forget that you have to pick it up with your badge. This is the conference T-shirt, and the people from the Postgres. Um, uh, office notes tell me that there are a little bit of uh, extra swag that you can still acquire, so be quick, otherwise you're not going to have what you want. And now we are ready, so please, uh, thanks again, Peter Eisentrott. Great job, thanks. <laughs>